Hello and good morning or good evening, depending on where you're at. My name is Laura Kleina. I'm the Assistant Director and Secretary for Amazing Earth Fest. I would like to note a few things before we begin. First, for those who have not participated in a Zoom webinar before, attendees will not be able to see themselves or other attendees. Please save your questions for the end or type them into the question and answer or chat feature below and we will get to you after Joe speaks. Secondly, we invite you to register for as many of our free presentations and documentary films as you can. Please feel free to share this information as well as your experience with your friends, families, and acquaintances. The events and registration are both free. Lastly, we would like to thank all of our donors who make our program possible this year, especially Joe and Barbara Andrade, the Wilderness Society, Dreamland Safari Tours, Grand Canyon Expeditions, Honey's Fuel and Garden Nursery, Paul and Denise Berman, Victoria Cooper, and Maida at Withers. And if you are enjoying our festival and would like to make a donation, please visit our website. And now to Rich, our director. Hey, thank you, Laura. Hello, everyone. I'm Rich Singe. I'm founding director of Southern Utah's Amazing Earth Fest and president of our nonprofit organization. And I just want to thank you for the opportunity tonight to be with you. Uh, we trust that you will find our 2022 festival events personally rewarding and memorable. Um, Laramidia, the Western landmass of North America, isolated in prehistoric times by the Western Interior Seaway, hosted some of the most diverse dinosaur ecosystems ever uncovered. In this session, it is our distinct privilege to learn from Joe Sertich curator of dinosaurs at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science about the wondrous range of fossil discoveries unearthed on the Kaiparowitz Plateau of Southern Utah in the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Joe, go ahead and begin your share, presentation. Go ahead and share this here. Thank you for the introduction, Rich. Hopefully that's showing up for everybody. Um, yeah, thank you so much for, for tuning in. I'm really excited to share some of these discoveries from Southern Utah with all of you. Uh, I first got my start in Grand Staircase as a graduate student 18 years ago in 2004. Um, so it was about uh, five years into the paleontology project down there. Um, and things were just really starting to get started when I got on the ground. Um, and it's been nonstop discovery ever since. So it's really, really a, a privilege and honor for me to be able to share some of these discoveries with you. Uh, and it's really cool to remember that all these dinosaurs are from public lands and they belong to uh, the people of the United States. They belong to all of you. Um, these don't belong to museums. You know, They don't belong to the Denver Museum or the Utah Museum. They belong to the American public. So it's a cool story. And I wanna share that with you today. So I am at the... Uh, Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Let me get this thing to switch its slide here. And we sit on some of the best dinosaur hunting grounds uh, in the West, including um, Denver itself, which sits right on the KPG boundary. So the KPG boundary is the, the moment in time when an asteroid hit North America um, down just off the coast of Mexico. And um, we believe, at least the mounting evidence shows that 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 event caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. So here you see uh, what ancient Denver would have looked like. This is one of the first places in the Rocky Mountain region where dinosaurs were found. Um, that includes the very first ostrich dinosaur. You see those in the background kind of running away from the T-Rex. We have amazing T-Rex fossils from here in the Denver area um, and lots of other bits of information, including the plants and the small little critters. And we do occasionally find dinosaurs uh, in the Denver area. This was a discovery that we made in 2017, so five years ago now, of a horned dinosaur called Torosaurus. It's closely related to Triceratops. In fact, it looks very similar, except that the frill or the shield behind the head uh, is full of these big holes. And that's what Toro means. It means kind of windowed or open uh, frill. And so this is a different type of horned dinosaur. And the one that we found here in Denver was on a construction project and it turned out to be the most complete uh, Taurosaurus ever discovered. This is what a reconstruction of that animal looks like. So those holes are covered with flesh and skin. Um, they wouldn't show up on the, the actual animal in life. 
Uh, but this is what ancient Denver would have looked like. But what I want to share with all of you today is something um, a little bit nearer and dearer to my heart. Like I said, for 18 years now, I've been working in um, remote parts of the world, all the way from Antarctica to East Africa. But it's here in the American West that uh, I, I'm really, really excited about these discoveries. And when we talk about dinosaurs in the American West, you can't rely on uh, those discoveries by chance, those construction project discoveries like we had with our Taurosaurus here in Denver. You have to go hunting dinosaurs. And the best place to do that, uh, at least here in the, the Rocky Mountain West and the Colorado Plateau, is on public lands. And so here's a map of the Western US. You can see the green represents forest service. The yellow is Bureau of Land Management land. And so these are some of the best places to go because uh, these are resources that are protected and managed so that we can learn from them. And so when you talk about public lands, we often think about um, all of the other uses, the common uses, including you know, livestock range, um, extractive uses like uh, oil and gas or minerals, uh, even timber. So the, the trees you see there in the lower left. And then a, a very large part of public lands is even for outdoor recreation. So getting out and um, hiking, biking, fishing, hunting, all of those different uses are what we often associate public lands with. They're also really important for preserving um, our cultural past. And so um, the remains of past civilizations here in North America and a lot of the public lands uh, that have recently been protected, including things like Bears Ears National Monument are protected because of these cultural resources in addition to other uh, unique aspects. And like I said at the very beginning, there are some things um, that people don't think about with public lands. And the one that I think it's overlooked most often is science. I think public lands are one of the best places if you're a geologist or a paleontologist, a biologist, ecologist, where you can go out and make these discoveries because this land is set aside and protected and managed uh, in ways that allow us to learn from the land. And so in 1996, when Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument was first established in southern Utah, that was the main impetus of the monument, was setting aside this land so that it could act as a natural laboratory. So scientists could go out, uh, make discoveries, whether that was looking at the plants and animals, looking at the unique rocks um, and the, the deep time aspect of, of this really unique corner of Utah. And then also preserving fossils. So fossils were, are, are really well known from Grand Staircase. They've been known for decades. And some of those early discoveries in the 60s, 70s, 80s were used to justify the creation of the monument. And this is an amazing, amazing place to go for fossils. Uh, the main place that I work is in the Cretaceous, but the fossil record of Grand Staircase goes back to before the dinosaurs um, and it extends to uh, basically the Ice Age. So just, uh, just before humans enter the scene here in the West. Um, so an amazing fossil record. And it's the Cretaceous in particular that I think is unique because it is such a continuous, uh, beautiful record, uh, uninterrupted record of what uh, was going on in the Rocky Mountain West um, for about a 20 million years, so an uninterrupted 20 million year window into evolution on, on land and in the sea. Um, like Rich said when he did the introduction, uh, we're focused on what's called the landmass of Laramidia. So some of you may have heard of this before. Laramidia was uh, the western part of North America that was separated when a great western interior seaway connected from the Arctic in the north to the Gulf of Mexico in the south and essentially split North America in half. So the western half uh, has been nicknamed Laramidia. It was a dynamic place. Uh, the early Rocky Mountains were just coming up. Um, to the east, on the flank of those mountains, you had these broad coastal plains, which were perfect for hosting dinosaur ecosystems. So things like um, early plants, uh, dinosaurs, and other animals. So things like crocodiles and, and turtles and frogs and birds. Um, really, the whole host of animals is preserved along the coast of Laramidia. And dinosaurs from Laramidia have been known for over 120 years. So this is a diagram that you'll see throughout this talk. So just to kind of orient you on what's going on here. On the far left, there's a series of numbers. Those are millions of years before the present. So um, 71 million years ago to 83 is what this chart represents. This is a time period that we call the Campanian. Um, and this is a 
really integral part of understanding terrestrial evolution because during the Campanian, we had early Rocky Mountain uplift, we had the Western Interior Seaway fluctuating to the east, and it was a hothouse world, so higher uh, carbon dioxide levels, um, and we're able to look back into the past into Laramidia to understand what these ecosystem dynamics were. And then the center part, you see these gray bars, those are rock units. Um, each of them has its own name depending on where you are in the West. So if you're up in Canada, you have uh, rock formations on the far left. So the old man and the dinosaur park formation there in the center. Um, and as you move to the right of these gray, you're actually moving farther south. And those are represented on the far right as those stars. So those red stars represent where you would go to find each of those rocks and the dinosaurs that are preserved in those rocks. And the dinosaurs of Laramidia time, at least, uh, fall largely into, at least the large bodied ones, um, fall into these four different groups. Those are the horned dinosaurs called ceratopsids. So you see them on the lower right. There's two different flavors of ceratopsids um, shown here. The ankylosaurs are armored dinosaurs. You see they're on the lower left um, with big spikes and plates on their back, big flat heads. I've got one over my shoulder here in the background. Uh, hadrosaurs, so the duckbill dinosaurs, often called the cows of the Cretaceous. Uh, these are very abundant dinosaurs. Uh, if you find a dinosaur bone in the Campanian, you're, it's most likely to be a hadrosaur. And then everyone's familiar with uh, tyrannosaurs. So these are all the ancestors of T. rex. So about 10 million years before T. rex ruled the Rocky Mountain West, we had several different versions of tyrannosaur um, that stocked the other three on this list. And then there are a bunch of other smaller types of dinosaurs, but I really want to focus on these four, because they're the ones that tell us a lot about what's going on biogeographically. So looking at how dinosaurs and dinosaur ecosystems are distributed across the landscape. This is what the Kaparowitz formation of Grand Staircase uh, Escalante National Monument looks like. This is the main rock unit that's been studied really for the last 60 or 70 years, um, with most attention coming in the last 20 years or so. Uh, this is a view north from Highway 12 in southern Utah toward Powell Point there in, in the far background. And all of these gray rocks represent coastal floodplains, uh, shallow lakes, and rivers. So this is a dynamic coastal plain full of uh, exactly the right ingredients for preserving dinosaurs and their ecosystems. And the Kaparowitz is very similar to other parts of Laramidia. So here you see that again, the Kaparowitz in the upper left. The upper right is the dinosaur park formation of Southern Alberta. The lower right is, um, I don't remember where that is. I think, oh, that's the Judith River formation of Montana. And the lower left is New Mexico. That's the Fruitland Kirtland formations down near Chaco Canyon. So all of these um, are exposed as beautiful badlands. As a dinosaur paleontologist, I love going to places like this dropping in from helicopters, going deep into the backcountry, and just combing these rocks for fossils and evidence of past life. Before the monument, so pre-1996, dinosaurs were known from Grand Staircase or from Southern Utah, from this region, uh, from the Caparitas Formation in particular, but they weren't very spectacular. So there on the lower left, you see some chunks of rock with some white smears. Uh, that represents the tubes of the crested dinosaur Parasaurolophus. You see represented at the top with that skeleton. Not a beautiful specimen. Uh, on the right is an ostrich mimic dinosaur. Um, this is a beautiful specimen that's at the Museum of Northern Arizona down in Flagstaff, but it represents mostly the hips and the feet of this ostrich dinosaur. We still don't know exactly who or what this ostrich mimic dinosaur is. It hasn't been formally named. And so at the beginning of the Laramidia project and some of the work that was going on that was uh, basically uh, instigated by the creation of the monument, there was uh, an initial hypothesis that the Caparowitz formation dinosaurs would be the same as the dinosaurs that you find up in the dinosaur park formation uh, in Alberta. And that's because these two rock units have a lot of fossils. And if you look at where they, they land on the time scale, they're both centered right over 76 million years ago. So we have the exact same time window, um, somewhere between 75.5 and 76.5 million years ago. So the hypothesis was the dinosaurs should be the same. Laramidia isn't huge. Um, it's about 
one fifth or 20% of the current land area of North America. And on North America today, you find a lot of the same animals uh, depending on where you are. So bison ranged over most of the continent. Things like gray wolves range over most of the continent. You don't expect to find uh, big groups of, di of, of mammals that are different from north to south or east to west. Um, and so that was the initial hypothesis for the early work in Laramidia. And to test that, you have to go out and look for fossils. And so that was the impetus for um, starting this big project. It was initiated by the monument itself. So Alan Titus, the monument paleontologist, uh, has been instrumental in attracting research to Grand Staircase. Um, some of the first researchers were from the Museum of Northern Arizona and the uh, University of Utah. Uh, Natural History Museum of Utah, and teams from those areas were out looking for dinosaurs that they expected to be the same as the ones from Canada. But it didn't take long to realize that it wasn't the case. So this is what it looks like when you're out in the Kaparowitz. It's huge. Um, it's a massive area. It's remote. It's really difficult to get to. Often you're dealing with inclement weather or really bad roads. Um, so it can be a really tough place to work. Uh, the rock itself is really difficult. And I think largely the reason dinosaurs weren't well known before the creation of the monument was because it was just so hard to get in there. The logistics of getting fossils out of really remote areas and out of really hard rock, like you see here, uh, just wasn't feasible. You needed that, um, that extra push from the monument and from um, the, the logistical support of having a monument and paleontologists with the monument. So here you can see we're cutting out a duckbill dinosaur with a diamond bladed rock saw. All of these fossils have to be hand carried out because these are wilderness or wilderness study areas. Um, so we can't use wheels, we can't use wheelbarrows and game carts, things like that. You have to carry them out. Or if you're really lucky, you get to helicopter them out. So this is a duck billed dinosaur skull and neck uh, that was found by one of our former interns who's now a scientist here at the Denver Museum who works on fossil plants. She found this amazing fossil um, it was way too big to carry out. It was about a half mile to the road. So we had to wait until we could get a helicopter out there. And the reason that we keep coming back is because these fossils are really spectacular, absolutely stunning. So this is uh, impressions of duckbill dinosaur skin. So that, that hadrosaur skull that you saw us helicoptering out was completely wrapped in skin around the throat and the face. Um, so those little bumps and um, knobs on the right side are all the different scales that would have been the surface of the dinosaurs. You can actually touch and feel what the surface of a dinosaur skin would have would have felt like, which is really cool. We're starting to find things like dinosaur nests. So this time period is really well known up in places like Montana for preserving early dinosaur nesting behavior. So some of the first evidence of dinosaurs as good parents um, came, came from Laramidia. And we're starting to find that evidence in the the Grand Staircase region as well. And then like I mentioned earlier, we're finding the other parts of the ecosystem. These are gigantic turtles. This is a turtle called Basilemmes. Uh, we found at least six or seven of these giant turtle shells all mashed in with a horned dinosaur skull, which I'll show you here in a little bit. And we know that these are all females because each of these turtle shells is full of ping pong ball size eggs. And so these female turtles were coming into a sandbar most likely to lay those eggs um, and some catastrophic event buried them all simultaneously along with that dinosaur skull in a river uh, sandstone. And we also find the arms and legs and skulls of these turtles mixed in with the shells. So we know that they were there and weren't transported to the spot. And we've been working with paleo artists. You'll see a lot of paleo art throughout my talk to reconstruct the ecosystem of Kaparowitz. So it's more than just the dinosaurs. We're also trying to paint pictures of what the plants were like, what the, um, the landscape itself might've looked like, uh, shallow uh, freshwater basins full of lush vegetation. And early on, we were starting to get a good picture of that just based on the geology of the Kaparowitz formation. And by, um, about a few years ago, I'd say about five years ago, this is what we had from the Kaparowitz. So there are nine recognized dinosaur species. Of those, seven of them have been formally named to species level. So that's seven brand new species from just the Kaparowitz formation. Um, and all of them are new to science. So every single one of these dinosaurs that you see, the nine here, um, are either brand new genera. 
So things like Utahceratops and Hagriffus and Teratophonius are dinosaurs that are not known from anywhere else. Um, and they're unique to this area. And by far the biggest superstars of the dinosaur world from Grand Staircase have always been the horned dinosaurs. So that includes Utah Ceratops on the left. And I'd like to point out the different horn shapes for you at this point, because this will become relevant a little bit later on. So Utah Ceratops has a fairly stout nose horn and stubby little eyebrow horns that stick off to the side. Cosmoceratops is one of the most ornamented uh, horned dinosaurs known. It has uh, big rainbow-like horns coming off the eyes that kind of arc off to the side. And it's that back of the frill with the, what I call bangs, the big horns that are kind of curled over the back of the frill um, that make Cosmoceratops unique. And then on the far right is Nasutoceratops. Nasuto means big nosed. So this is the big nose horn face. And the Suto is unique in having these really bull-like horns that wrap around the front and curl toward the front. Um, different from a Triceratops that has fairly straight horns that poke straight off the forehead. These are big curving horns that really wrap around in a unique way. And when we compared those horned dinosaurs to the ones from the north, we noticed a couple of patterns. First, uh, in Northern Laramidia, so places like the Dinosaur Park Formation, these horned dinosaurs are staggered through time. So I mentioned that there are two different groups of horned dinosaurs. Um, the yellow ones on the left are called centrosaurs and you see that they're staged through time. So as you're moving from the bottom to the top, you have different species replacing each other as you step up through time. So this species called centrosaurus goes extinct around um, 20, eight meters from the bottom of the formation, and then it's replaced by this horned dinosaur called Styracosaurus. The same pattern holds for the other family of dinosaurs, or horned dinosaurs. And what that means is that at any given point in time, you usually have two different horned dinosaurs living together. So let's say at 25, you have Centrosaurus and this dinosaur over in the orange called Chasmosaurus. So at any given time slice along here, you have two. And that was different from what we were already seeing in Grand Staircase, where there's two in the north, and we have three living at the same time in the south. Um, so you could call that extreme diversity. I wouldn't call that extreme yet at this point, although I hope to convince you that things get a little more extreme. But three versus two is a pattern that we were seeing early on. If you looked at the duckbill dinosaurs, it was flipped. So that you had three different types of duckbill dinosaurs in the north, and only two were well known from the south. And that included different species of hump-nosed duckbill dinosaurs and different species of tube-crested duckbill dinosaurs called Parasaurolophus. So even though they're um, from the same basic group, they're different at the species level. And what that led to then, about 10 years into the project, was a new hypothesis that these dinosaurs from southern Utah were very different, completely different from the ones in the south. And that led to this hypothesis of north-south dinosaur endemism. So you have different groups of dinosaurs living in different places. And so in order to, to get these separate populations, paleontologists and geologists have gone looking for reasons why you might have that. So again, it's a small landmass. You wouldn't expect there to be major differences, at least at the level we were seeing, which is completely different species. So some people have hypothesized that there were giant mountain chains that might have separated populations, huge river systems that might have separated populations, and maybe even um, coast uh, or uh, seaway incursions that were able to basically split these populations. We still don't have good evidence for any of these three scenarios, but something was going on. There is definitely evidence that um, there is a difference, at least among the horned dinosaurs and maybe with some of the other species as well. And in order to test this hypothesis, we have to go back to the rocks yet again. And that's what I want to share with you today is some of these new dinosaur discoveries and what they're teaching us and leading us to basically a third hypothesis um, of why there are different dinosaurs from north to south and why Grand Staircase in particular is such a special place for making these discoveries. So among the new discoveries coming out of um, some of the teams working, this is um, a new armored dinosaur that was named about five or six years ago called Acanacephalus. 
Acanocephalus was collected by the Natural History Museum of Utah teams. And it supported this north-south endemic hypothesis, so hypothesis two, because it was much different from the ones that were known from the, the, the north. And in fact, it closely it, would, it turned out to be closely related to dinosaurs that were known from New Mexico and possibly even dinosaurs that we're working on right now from Texas versus the dinosaurs from the north, which all seem to be more closely related to each other. Another discovery from the University of Utah team um, is challenging that. So this is a new dinosaur that they're working on right now. I can't give you any more information on this. It's super secret, um, except to say that there might be some overlap with the North. So there might be a, a yellow Northern type of armored dinosaur showing up in the South. So maybe some of the first evidence that this North-South separation wasn't quite as clean as we would have hoped. We made a discovery recently of what's called an orodromine. Uh, this is a small dinosaur, a plant eater. So you see it in the center of this, this paleo art as the kind of fluffy pink one. Um, fairly nondescript, two-legged plant eating dinosaur, long tail, it would have been about the size of a golden retriever as an adult, so fairly small. And then we even find babies of this. So this is a teeny tiny little skeleton where we have a complete arm and leg wrapped around a skull and a tail. And this little specimen would fit in the palm of your hands, about the size of a kitten. So we have this brand new species of dinosaur represented from babies all the way to adults. If we look at this little section, this is actually the jaws. And you can see those teeny tiny little teeth. Each one of those teeth is about two millimeters across. So really, really small animal, little plant eater. This is what the adult skeleton looks like. Uh, this is a group of dinosaurs that is known from the north. Um, and the northern specimens are known for having really unique characteristics of the foreland. So the shoulder, the shoulder blade show evidence of possible burrowing behavior. Um, so there are different attachments for muscles that indicate that they might have been burrowers. And in fact, some of the individual specimens have been found in what are interpreted to be burrows. And so we think that these northern forms were burrowers, but the one from the south, the one from the Kaparowitz, doesn't show those. So the shoulder blade and the upper arm bones don't show those adaptations for burrowing. And we think that might be an indicator of the, the local environment. It was a much wetter environment in the Kaparowitz in Southern Utah at the time. Um, the same time in the North, it was much drier. So that you're in a much better drained soil. So if you're digging into the ground, you want it to be fairly dry. You don't want to dig a burrow and then drown in your burrow. And the other thing that, um, this discovery in the Kaparowitz has shown us is that this group is present from north to south. It's not just a northern group. And the reason that we might not see it in a lot of these other southern formations, so these other stars farther south in New Mexico and Texas, is because we don't have rocks of the right age yet. And so we don't have um, rocks that are older than 75.5 million years ago when these dinosaurs were common throughout the Rocky Mountain West. And so it was an apparent um, north-south divide that's probably just a, a result of differential preservation. Let's come back to the duckbills. There's a really cool story here with the duckbills that's just starting to emerge really over the last year and a half based on some of the discoveries that we've been making. So again, three in the north, two in the south. Um, our very first season with the Denver Museum in 2011, we went out and we found this small duckbill dinosaur. It's one that we probably wouldn't normally have collected, um, but because it was our very first season, um, there was enough bone there that we went back for it and collected it in 2012 and 2013. And it's turned out to be a really important specimen, um, both because of its completeness. Here you see a beautiful tail vertebrae. Um, we have really large parts of the skeleton. We have the hips. And it's actually the hips that showed us that this might be something a little bit different than what we expected. So we would have expected one of the two known duckbill dinosaurs, maybe this would be a juvenile. But when we compare the hips of this, this is the one on the top is called the ilium. And if we compare the ilium of this new dinosaur to the ilium of Parasaurolophus, so the tube crested duckbill dinosaur on the right there, you can see that it's quite different in shape. So Parasaurolophus has this very straight top margin of its hip, whereas this one has this very curved, indented dorsal margin or top margin of its hip. And a few other features are quite different um, with the specimen. So we started to get an idea that this might be 
something that wasn't previously known from the Kaparowitz, which made us turn back to the little fragments. Whenever you go out and you find a dinosaur, you collect the surface, it's covered in all these chunks of bone, little cubes of bone. All the people I have out with me always ask me, why are we even bothering to pick these up? Well, this is why, because we went back to these fragments and we were able to sort out exactly where they went on the skull. So even though they're tiny little pieces, we were able to say that some went over the eye, some went onto part of the jaws, some went onto the back of the brain case. And this piece in particular is important. It's, it's about the size of a quarter, so a little tiny piece of bone. So we have most of the skeleton, but this one little quarter sized piece of bone shows us that this particular dinosaur was probably not represented before in the Kaparowitz. It's this dome or crested or hooded type of crested duckbill dinosaur. And it basically fills in that gap that we had. So now we have three to three. And so for the very first time, we can say that we have the same dinosaurs. The identity of this one is still a question. So here you see the new Kaparowitz form. It overlaps in time with some of our other crested forms. Um, and in the north, it overlaps with possibly three different hooded or crested forms that are closely related. So we can't say yet which one it is, but we do know that we have one of these forms from the north. So it's really exciting. But let's go back to the main two. So these are abundant dinosaurs. We have literally dozens of skulls of each uh, from the Kaparowitz formation. Um, probably the best sample uh, in the world of the two crested duckbill dinosaur Parasaurolophus comes from Grand Staircase. Um, as does some of the best preserved skeletons and skulls of the hump-nosed um, duckbill dinosaurs called Gryposaurus. And when we look at where they're distri distributed in time, so this is that same diagram, I'll zoomed in a little bit. So this is looking at just 75 to 78 million years ago. We start to see an interesting pattern. And this is a pattern that it's gonna come up um, over the next few slides. And I just wanna draw attention to it now. So between about 76.5 and 77 million years ago, we have this two crested duckbill dinosaur represented in both the North and the South. So different species, but they are present in both places. And that indicates that this type of duckbill dinosaur called a Parasaurolophus was widespread on the Remedia. So it was probably uh, distributed across the coastal plain from North to South. But then something happens at 76.5 or 76.7, somewhere in there, where Parasaurolophus completely disappears from the north and becomes a southern taxon. And so we see the persistence of Parasaurolophus after 76.5 in places like uh, southern Utah and also New Mexico, and also into much younger rocks in places like uh, Mexico, where there are other crested dinosaurs that are very similar to Parasaurolophus known from central Mexico. And so this becomes a southern form after 76.5. So remember that number, 76.5. And let's look at one of the other groups. Let's look at our hump noses. So here we, here we have hump noses on the left from the north, and then from Grand Staircase, uh, represented by a single taxon on the right. Uh, work that's ongoing right now suggests that we might have two different species of Gryposaurus from Grand Staircase. The one at the top has been named, that's Gryposaurus monumentensis. It's named after Grand Staircase. And then the one that's a little bit older, the lower one, we still haven't done the work. So some of my colleagues are working on that, looking at the skulls of some of these others to see if it's a new species or if it's the same as the one from the north. Um, the one from the north is called Gryposaurus notabilis. And it's possible that Gryposaurus notabilis, at least between 76.5-ish and 77 million years ago, was widespread from north to south. But again, somewhere around 76.5 million years ago, this group disappears from the north uh, and continues in the south. So again, that number, 76 and a half million years ago, there's a big shift and the hump noses disappear in the north, but persist in the south and continue into much younger rocks in places like Mexico and New Mexico and even Texas. And so we can say that this group, at least younger than 76.5 million years ago, is a southern group of duckbill dinosaurs. We were a bit surprised during 
the early stages of COVID, our COVID lockdown, we went back to our cabinets of unprepared fossils and we had this duckbill dinosaur skull that I'd collected in 2016, so six years before. Um, and we assumed it was just going to be another partial Gryposaurus skull. This is um, all we recovered from it, but it turns out to be a really important chunk. This is what it looks like fully cleaned. And it doesn't look like much if you're not a dinosaur expert. So I've done some diagramming for you. Um, this actually represents a type of duck-billed dinosaur called a Brachylophosaur or Brachylophosaurin. And they have a plate-like crest over the back of their head. The orange parts on this diagram are the parts that we recovered. So we can say for sure that it's not the hump nose form. It has, has this crest. Um, and these are really well known from the north. So Brachylophosaurus canadensis is known from Montana and Southern Alberta. It's been known for over hundred years. It's a really well-known group of dinosaurs, but it hadn't yet been found in the Kaparowitz. And what's really interesting about this is the story that adding Brachylophosaurus to Kaparowitz shows us. So we've, we've known for a long time that in some of the older rocks in Grand Staircase, Brachylophosaurus or something like Brachylophosaurus uh, probably existed, and that's based on a couple of isolated chunks of skull. But this new skull puts it into a whole new territory. So it shows us that this group of dinosaurs, Brachylophosaurus, were really widespread until about 77 million years ago. So it was another one of those north-south distributed groups. And it even goes back farther in time. So um, there are ones from New Mexico called Ornithops, and probably even from Texas and Mexico that haven't been described yet that show that this group was widespread um, during this early part of Laramidia. But then we only have one occurrence now. This is the Kaparowitz form is now the last or youngest known member of this group. And even this type of dinosaur goes extinct right at, you guessed it, 76.5 million years ago. So there's a big shift that's happening from north to south at about 76.5 million years ago. I still don't know what that is. I don't know what that represents. Um, and it's something that we've just noticed in the data really over the past couple of months. Um, so it's something I'm excited to explore and see what that might be related to. A climate shift, um, a big shift in mountain building, I don't know yet. And I can't tell you uh, any more than there's an observation of a 76.5 million year shift. Well, let's come back to our horned dinosaurs. So remember, they have different horns over the eyes. And in um, north to south, you have, again, two versus three. And in the, at least among the southern forms, Grand Staircase is unique in having um, multiple different species at a given point. So all the other known horned dinosaurs from the south are known as just a single type. We don't have multiple in a single fauna. So Grand Staircase is already unique among the Southern groups and having three at once. So it was a bit surprising starting in about 2012, so 10 years ago, when we uncovered some horned dinosaur remains in Grand Staircase that had a horn over the eye that was quite different in shape. So this is the horn coming off here to the right, that's the tip of the horn. And then where the hand is here in the picture with the, the metal spike, that's where the eye would have been. So these orange parts are the parts we recovered of that very first horned dinosaur. It was a juvenile. In 2013, we started to find more evidence of this type of dinosaur. And these are the parts, again, big horn over the eyes that sticks straight up. 2014, we found yet another version of this. This is the entire top of the head along with the snout and lower jaws. And so by this point, we're starting to suspect that something is going on. Either we have um, sexual dimorphism in one of the three known forms, so maybe this is a male versus a female, and we kept digging. And that's the power of Grand Staircase, is having so many rocks protected that we can go out and keep uh, making these discoveries. 2014, we found yet another version of this, this one more complete, showing us what the back of the, the head looked like, the frill. And by this point, we were then sure that this was a new species. Later that same year, we found a complete skull. This is the complete head of one of these. I'll show you what this looks like clean. So this is a very complete view of what this new horned dinosaur looks like. 
The Utah Museum recovered one a year later in 2015, representing most of the skull. And then by 2018, we had a really nice chunk of frill. So usually when you find a new dinosaur, you find one, you find maybe a, a second. But in Grand Staircase, the rocks are so loaded with fossils that we were able to recover at least seven um, and possibly even more than seven skulls of a brand new type of horned dinosaur. And what that means is we're throwing four in at the same time that there are only two in the north. So this is where it's starting to get a little bit extreme. So it was a bit of a surprise yet again to find another type of dinosaur. So this is a bone bed. Um, the bones are the orange chunks that are scattered throughout the rock here. Um, you see a shoulder blade. This is the, the shoulder blade or the scapula. This is actually the cheekbone, we call it a jugal. This is part of the arm bone. So we have a, a big mishmash of dinosaur bones. And when we first started to clean them, we noticed that they were also different from the other four different horned dinosaurs. And we thought that it might represent what was always considered to be a mystery. We, call it a, we called it Centrosaur B. Um, it was just this chunk of frill or shield that was quite different from the others, but there wasn't enough to really go off of. And so over the last several years, we've been able to get out to this site. We've collected a ton more. This is the cheekbone with parts of the frill. We've got a complete lower jaw. And we now have enough when you combine the different individuals from the quarry to say that this is a completely different type of horned dinosaur. Um, this one probably is Centrosaur B. And this was a um, revelation that we made uh, a couple of months ago that there was enough overlap between what we had coming out of the ground and what had already been um, designated as Centrosaur B to say that this is probably this mystery dinosaur. And what's really cool is when you line all these up in Kaparowitz time in the rocks, all of them fall within this exact same time zone. And so we can say with certainty based on our measurements of the rock unit and where these discoveries have come from, that all, all five of these dinosaurs lived at the exact same time in the Kaparowitz, which is totally crazy. This is extreme. So in the North, at any given time, you have two, maybe up to three. And in the South, in the Kaparowitz, we have five different horned dinosaurs living at the exact same time. We see a similar pattern even with the tyrannosaurs. So this is a tyrannosaur skull that was collected by uh, the monument paleontologist Alan Titus and the Natural History Museum of Utah, which is where it resides now. Um, Dr. Titus had a really cool paper that came out uh, about a year ago showing that um, this type of tyrannosaur did live in groups. So we have a bone bed that he discovered where there are multiple individuals from babies up to full grown adults of this type of tyrannosaur. And it shows that these tyrannosaurs were also distributed as north-south um, endemics. So there's different ones in the north versus the south, and we don't have a lot of overlap between those. So we're getting a lot of different signals from the different groups, but what it's showing us is that um, there's probably a third hypothesis that's emerging uh, just over the last few years, and that's that climate and latitude and not things like mountains or sea level is probably what's driving this diversity. And we can test that with our paleothermometers. So paleothermometers uh, in the fossil record are uh, cold-blooded animals. So things that are ectothermic that rely on uh, the temperature of their environment to survive. And if you look at ectotherms like crocodiles, you see a similar pattern where in the Kaparowitz we have at least six different types of crocodile versus the north where there's only two. If we look at the micro, vertebrates, so the little tiny lizards, the little snakes, the little amphibians, we see a similar pattern. So this is a great paper that was done in 2013. We followed up on that with some new ones uh, in 2020, um, showing that even with the lizards, you get these same patterns where some are distributed from north to south, like you see in C, some are north only or south only, like you see in the upper right, some are south only, like you see in the lower right, that uh, purple. So you see a mix of different groups of dinosaurs and animals basically distributing across a latitudinal gradient, so north to south. And the best way to test that uh, is with fossil plants. So fossil plants are very dependent on paleoclimate. You can actually look at different features of plants 
and determine whether they were growing in a seasonally tropical or subtropical environment versus a temperate environment. And when we plot out fossil plants, this is done by a colleague of mine, Ian Miller at National Geographic. Um, you see that you get a temperate zone right around where we have the northern dinosaurs, the ones from Dinosaur Park, and a tropical zone or subtropical zone where are grand staircases. So what we're looking at is the difference between temperate and tropical. And so it's probably not surprising to have completely different dinosaurs from the Kukarowitz versus the North based on the ecosystems. And what's really great is we're able to take all of those known dinosaurs, those nine or 10 recognized dinosaurs, and just based on the discoveries we've made over the last few years, we're more than doubling the diversity. So we're going to add at least another dozen new dinosaurs to the Kaparowitz formation in the next few years. I just wanna to touch on a couple of things really quickly um, to show how we test this. I've got a few minutes left before I take questions. And to do that, I wanna talk about um, how you might test this north-south hypothesis, um, this diversity gradient from um, tropical to subtropical to temperate. And that's by looking up and down section as well. So if you look down below the Kaparowitz formation, you have the Wawit formation uh, preserved in Southern Utah. We've known for a long time that the Wawit has great dinosaurs, really cool fossils. Um, right now there are five known brand new to science species, including the horned dinosaurs Diabloceratops and the meat-eating dinosaur Lythronax. But we think that there's enough time represented in the Wawit formation that there are three different stacks of dinosaur ecosystems um, representing different snapshots in time. And so we can actually compare those snapshots in time from the south and to the north and see where this pattern of north-south endemism originated. And we're still in the very early stages, but we're making really cool discoveries in the Wawit. This is a new dome-headed dinosaur called a pachycephalosaur. And we have at least two new types of dome-headed dinosaur from the Wawit formation from two different biotas, and we can compare those to the north. We have at least two new horned dinosaurs that we're working on right now. Um, these are some of the first glimpses of what these new horned dinosaurs look like. And we're working on several new duck-billed dinosaurs. So this is a nearly complete back half of a skeleton of a duck-billed dinosaur. This one is really interesting because well, we, when we first uh, started to uncover it, we were hoping to have a complete dinosaur, the whole skull, everything represented, but we got to the end over here on the left where the gentleman in the blue shirt is and the skeleton just ended. And we found the evidence for why represented by these blobs at the top. So these are all called coprolites and these are gigantic coprolites. This is fossilized feces of what we, what we think is a gigantic a crocodile. So the reason that we only have half of the dinosaur skeleton at this site is probably because it was scavenged or eaten um, by things like giant crocodiles and turtles and all the other critters that live in the in the water. So this is what we have of this dinosaur, but the cool story about this site is the coprolites. And so just like the Kaparowitz formation, we're essentially doubling the known diversity. So all the orange dinosaurs on this slide are um, either being described right now by colleagues. Um, we're working on all these as we speak, and we're going to essentially double the known diversity from the wall week. And hopefully that helps us address the origins of this north-south latitudinal gradient. And then if you go the other direction, so looking upward, um, we've recently recovered evidence. Uh, this was done by a graduate student, Tegan Beveridge, who's down in Australia. And she's shown that the Kaparowitz actually gets much younger than we expected. So there's an, there was a, a mystery upper part of the Kaparowitz that hadn't yet been um, fully described that goes to at least 73, maybe even 72 million years ago. And that's really important because we can now look for fossils in the Kaparowitz that are the same age as fossils that are really well known from New Mexico. And so we've started to do that work. We found some really great sites last summer. We're hoping to get back out into some of these upper rock units and make more discoveries and look for fossils in the upper Kaparowitz that are the same age as what we have in New Mexico. And here at the Denver Museum, I've been lucky enough to have the resources and time and energy to go out and look for fossils in New Mexico as well. And we've made some really cool discoveries there. So it's a really beautiful place to work. 
really close to Chaco Canyon, where we've covered, uncovered a lot of the same types of dinosaurs. So this is the two crested Parasaurolophus. We've even discovered more horned dinosaurs. So this is a, a large skull of a horned dinosaur, probably um, the best known skull of a horned dinosaur called Navajo Ceratops. And even new Tyrannosaurs that again, support that idea that there's a north-south divide um, between New Mexico and Kaparowicz uh, all the way up to Canada. Um, but I really want to underscore the, the, the reason we're out there, and that's to understand these ecosystems in general. So the dinosaurs are really cool. A lot of you came to this talk to see the dinosaurs, but it's really the ecosystems that tell us what's going on and how we can learn um, and apply what we learn from the past to the present and understand what's going on around us today with our climate and the changing climate and the changing world. Um, and that's why protecting places like Grand Staircase are so important and public lands like Grand Staircase are so amazing. So with that, I want to end my dinosaur uh, presentation. I wanna thank Amazing EarthFest for having me uh, here tonight to describe some of these cool discoveries. Um, and as I mentioned several times throughout the talk, this is a huge collaborative project involving tons and tons of people from the federal government, from multiple institutions around the world, um, and tons and tons of volunteers and people who have made this work uh, possible. So with that, I would love to end this and see if any of you have any questions. Oh, Joe, thank you so much for that presentation. And yes, you have plenty of questions. Um, at the risk of me sounding very unintelligent, I'm hoping that you can read some of these dinosaur name questions <laughs> in the chat feature, <laughs> um, and you can go through there. Um, let me know if you're having any troubles with that, but you seem to be pretty uh, senior at taking care of YouTube questions. Just jump down here into the chat then. Uh-huh, looks like uh, 841, we have our first question. Okay, let me scroll. I can actually read the first two. Yeah, that'd be great. I'm trying to find so, them. Sure. Do the plant eaters have any incisors or do they have a dental pad? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, a lot of these dinosaurs that were plant eaters, at least in the late Cretaceous, had beaks. Um, so at the very front of their mouth, um, unlike the dental pad that you'd see in something like a bison or a cow, they had more bird-like beaks. Um, some of them even invented or evolved a uh, unique beak type of bone. So the horned dinosaurs have a, a bone on the tip of their upper snout called a rostral bone that didn't appear in any other dinosaurs. It's a unique bone. Um, and these beaks allow them to crop vegetation a lot like uh, animals today that have incisors or dental pads, um, but more in a, a bird-like way. So it's a, a different way of chomping on your, your plants. You can see it over my shoulder here. This armored dinosaur has a funny little beak. Let me point to it right there on the tip of its nose. And these duckbills also have a funny little beak. The next question, let's see, I, can, I found them now. It says, noting how rare it is for any one animal to become a fossil, how likely is it that we just haven't found the fossils from animals in the North yet in the South and vice versa? Can you expect to find all the animals represented as fossils in both spots, even if they existed in both? And that's a great question. Um, we think that uh, at least in the north, we are approaching what we call rarefaction. So the work in the north has been going on for over 120 years. Um, a lot of the fossils uh, that have come out over 120 years are duplicates of dinosaurs that are already known. Um, and down in the south, we are just at the very tip of the iceberg. We're about 20 years into discovery. Um, I would estimate that some of them are going to be the same as the north. So there should be overlap between the South and the North once we find better and more complete versions of those dinosaurs. Um, so we just have to keep working. But in the North, I think we have a pretty good picture of the different dinosaurs, who is, who is around um, based on that 120 years of work. We just need another 100 years or so to keep working Grand Staircase to be sure we have the full picture. So the next question, let's see. Would Utah Ceratops's frill likely be fragile like that of a Chasmosaurus? Um, yeah, so you noticed on a lot of these different dinosaurs, they have a really thin uh, bony frill. 
Um, Triceratops, which is our best known horned dinosaur, is a bit of an outlier in that it has a really thick, um, up to two or three inches thick, in fact, frill behind the head. All these other forms, so Cosmoceratops, uh, Utahceratops, Mesutoceratops, had frills that were really only a few millimeters thick, really thin frills. And so they probably would have been quite fragile. And that tells us that it probably wasn't used as a defensive uh, structure. So it wasn't used to protect the neck or the back of the body from a tyrannosaur, a hungry, hungry tyrannosaur. What they were probably used for was display. So kind of like a big billboard behind your head, they could flip their head forward and show off these big thin sheets of bone that were covered with possibly colorful skin or colorful patterns. Um, and so we know that these dinosaurs had uh, different types of spikes and frills on those billboards and they were using them to communicate in some way. And then the other question here is, how did you know that what you found for Centrosaur B is a Centrosaur instead of a Chasmosaur? So, um, Robert is a dinosaur expert. He knows the difference between centrosaurs and chasmosaurs. Um, I didn't get into that, but um, basically you can look at different features of the skull and the skeleton, and you can have, um, there are a couple of different features on centrosaur B that show that it is indeed a centrosaur, in particular in the lower jaw and in the shape of the frill. So one of the bones of the frill along the corner shows that it's, it's it belongs to a centrosaur and not a chasmosaur. So it's more closely related to Nasutoceratops than it is to Utahceratops and um, Cosmoceratops. Another question from Robert. How can you tell the new Pachycephalosaurus aren't Stegoceros? So Stegoceros is a really well-known uh, dome-headed dinosaur from Dinosaur Park Formation in Alberta. Um, the one that we have, uh, at least from the Kaparowitz, is very similar, but it has some different features along the face. And then the Pachycephalosaurus from the Waweep are much older, and they lack a couple of the deep grooves and fissures that you see on Stegoceros that are, that are really common along the top of the, the dome of Stegoceros. So we're pretty confident that it's not Stegoceros. It's closer in age to a dinosaur called Acrotholus. Uh, which is about a million years older. Um, and so we think that this might be an early offshoot of the dome-headed dinosaurs, at least here in North America. I have Another a question. question. Two. Um, it's um, by Jaden in the question and uh, answer feature. Uh, did those two ceratopsian dinosaurs get scientific names yet? Yeah, so we're working on that right now. So there's two new uh, Ceratopsians from the Kaparowitz, and I'm working to describe those hopefully later this year. And then there's two new ones from the Huawei. So there's actually four new horned dinosaurs, and those ones are being described by uh, a scientist in Utah, a colleague of mine, Mark Lowen, and I'm helping um, with that description right now. And so we should have all four of those horned dinosaurs described in the next year or two. So stay tuned, I would say. Let's see, another one from the chat. Someone said, I noticed that when I show the map of North and South dinos, they all have something in common. Are they the same? They just evolved into different forms. And yeah, that's the idea. So the idea is that they're from the same groups. So those four groups I introduced at the beginning, the, the horned dinosaurs, the duckbills, they just went their own separate ways in the different ornaments that they formed. Um, that they evolved on the edges of their frills, the different types of ornaments over their face. Um, and the same for the duckbill dinosaurs. They're all closely related to each other, but they represent different species. Um, so they are really close. Another question in the chat is, are those tyrannosaurs thought to be new species? Um, we're working on that right now. We think that the one from the Kaparowitz that was represented by that really nice complete skull um, could be something different. So there is a Tyrannosaur known from the Kaparowitz called Teratophonius curiae. Um, and we think that this uh, new discovery, and it's actually represented by several, um, could be something new. And then the new Tyrannosaur that we have in um, New Mexico could also be a new species. So I'm working on that one right now with some colleagues. Uh, Dan Deshevsky, who was one of my interns out in the Wawip and Kaparowitz years and years ago, uh, has a question. 
He says, what is the status of the monument these days? I know that there was a threat from the previous administration to shrink the boundaries and or open it to mining. Um, yeah, so uh, Grand Staircase was shrunk. So um, the previous administration did alter the boundaries and um, decrease the size of Grand Staircase by about half, but Grand Staircase was restored um, about a year ago. And so those original boundaries are back to the way they originally were designed in 1996. And that is to preserve uh, that really unique natural laboratory that the Grand Staircase represents. Next question in the chat here is, do they have unique skin? Did it change with climate? That's a really great question. And to, to address that, we need to find more skin. Um, right now we have skin patches on one of the din horned dinosaurs. We have a lot of skin associated with the hump-nosed Gryposaurus, duck-billed dinosaur. And we're just now starting to find skin on some of the other duck-billed dinosaurs like Parasaurolophus. But we don't have great skin from other parts of Laramidia at this time period to be able to say if it changed with climate. But it's a really cool idea, um, and I would love to I would love to explore that more. The next question is: Is the Triassic Jurassic boundary exposed anywhere in Grand Staircase? If so, is there any research being done there? Um, the Triassic Jurassic boundary. So this is much older than Laramidia. We're talking about um, something that's closer to uh, a little over 200 million years old. Um, it probably is represented in some of the rocks of Grand Staircase, although it might be a little bit of a gap in time. Um, and several teams have gone out looking for dinosaurs and other evidence from this time period. So this is an area of research by other geologists and other paleontologists. It's not something that um, I've explored because uh, just got too many dinosaurs from the Cretaceous from the younger rocks, um, but that is a really interesting time period and one where there is a major uh, mass extinction. So at the end of the Triassic is another mass extinction event. I have a question here, how heavy is an ankylosaurus? So an ankylosaur or armored dinosaur, like the one sitting over my shoulder here on the background, um, it depends on the species, but they were at least a ton, and some of the biggest ones were probably up to three, four, maybe even five tons for the largest, which is Ankylosaurus itself, which lived alongside T-Rex. So I had to get big to, to fend off something as large as a T-Rex. Oh, I skipped one. Uh, has there ever been controversy as to whether Utah Ceratops and Chasmosaurus were the same? Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, Utah Ceratops has um, a, a pretty unique frill, but its closest relatives are things like Chasmosaurus. The biggest difference between Utah Ceratops and uh, Chasmosaurus, which is known from the north, is the shape of those horns over the eyes. So Utah Ceratops has stubby little horns that stick straight off to the side, whereas a Chasmosaurus has slightly longer horns that point upward. And so those small differences are enough for us to be pretty confident that they were uh, different dinosaurs. And we now have enough Utah Ceratops, so a lot like that new species, we have at least uh, five or six different age groups of Utah Ceratops to see that, that that feature, those short horns were present throughout its life. So it's not just a, a unique individual. Uh, question here, which dinosaur are you excited to uncover the most? Oh, well, <laughs> that's so hard to, to to really narrow down which one's the most exciting. Um, really every discovery that we're making in Grand Staircase from the little tiny dinosaurs all the way up to the huge horned dinosaurs are exciting. Um, right now, the most exciting is that big um, new horned dinosaur because I have it back in the lab and we just finished cleaning the rest of its body. So we have most of the, the skeleton, not just the skull of this new type of horned dinosaur. And it's probably the most complete horned dinosaur from the southern part of Laramidia. So it's a really cool uh, chance to look at the proportions of the limbs and the proportions of the body uh, in addition to the differences in the skull. So it's really exciting. Uh, another one from Robert. If ceratopsian frills, except for triceratops, were too fragile for defense against tyrannosaurs, how would they defend themselves? Well, they do still have horns all over their face. So they have a horn on their nose. Uh, most of them have horns over their eyes. And much like uh, animals that have horns today, they would have used those um, if, if they needed to. So things like antelope or even deer and elk 
will use those antlers or horns to defend themselves. So I'm sure horned dinosaurs still use those big robust horns on the face. They just didn't use the, the really thin shield on the back of the head for defense. Let's see, the next one. At the risk of sounding like a five-year-old, don't worry about that, we're all five-year-olds at heart. What is your favorite dinosaur? Well, I get this question a lot. When I was, when I was a five-year-old, when I was a little kid, I loved the dinosaur Taurosaurus. And so when we found one five years ago here in the Denver area, and it turned out to be the most complete, that one jumped back to the front of the line for me. So I would say Taurosaurus right now is my favorite dinosaur, um, even though we've got so many cool ones and weird ones from Grand Staircase. Another question, how many different Triceratops are there? Well, Triceratops is a unique type of horned dinosaur that's known from the very end of the Cretaceous. Currently, there are two recognized species, although some paleontologists um, recognize more. Um, and we think that there are at least um, probably three or four known Triceratops species. And then if you go outside of Triceratops itself and just the horned dinosaurs, um, we've had essentially a renaissance in horned dinosaur discoveries over the past 15 years. Um, there are used to be about 10 or 12 known, and now they're getting close to 30 different known types of horned dinosaurs from uh, mostly North America. There is one from Asia that's known as well. Another question just popped up. Oh, two of them. Seeing that Taurosaurus is your favorite dinosaur, do you believe it is different from Triceratops? Uh, yeah, so this is a theory that's been put out by uh, several paleontologists who've worked on Triceratops and Taurosaurus, um, who have hypothesized that uh, Taurosaurus is just the adult form of a Triceratops, so it develops those big openings in the frill uh, late in its life. And I think based on the discoveries that we've made here in the Denver area and some of the work that we're, we're doing right now, um, I do think that they are separate species. And I think that we can show that based on the age of the different Taurosaurus that we have in our collections now, uh, the actual age when they died, not the age of the rocks that they were in. Uh, next question from Jason is, is there anything known about pterosaurs from the comparisons? Ah, great question, Jason. Uh, we have found a couple of pterosaur bones. The so pterosaurs are those um, flying reptiles like Pteranodon that many of you might be familiar with. They don't preserve very well in terrestrial sediments because the bones are so delicate. Um, imagine rolling up three sheets of paper into um, uh, basically a tube, and that's what their limb bones are like. We do have a couple of isolated limb bones. And I know that the Raymond Alf Museum in California, uh, who, who did work for decades in the Kaparowitz, uh, collected and they're working on a partial skeleton of a pterosaur right now. So another winged reptile. And that should be out, I would hope, in the next year or two. They've, they've done some really cool work uh, with their fossils. Since the bones are so old, have you broken many? Oh, yes. We break fossils all the time. So that's the, the great uh, secret of, of paleontology is in order to get them out of the ground, sometimes you, you have to break them. You can't, you can't know where they all are hidden inside the ground. So when we're collecting them, they often break, but we do it in a controlled way so that we can put them back together in the lab. And so all of the fossils that we've broken, we've been able to get back together. Uh, but we have broken a lot of them, but they're all, fat. They're all fixed right now. Uh, what is the smallest dinosaur? Uh, well, if you include modern birds, the smallest dinosaur is the bee hummingbird. Uh, that's the smallest dinosaur that's ever existed. But if you're just talking about the non-bird dinosaurs, um, there are a couple of really small plant eaters, similar to that orodromine I talked about. Um, so things like frutidens and some of these little tiny plant eaters that were about the size of a cat. So small, small animals. Um, and plant eaters, believe it or not. Any marine reptiles in the Kaparowitz? Hmm, actually there's a single tooth that we discovered about eight years ago. That's probably a plesiosaur tooth. So this is a long necked marine reptile like the Loch Ness Monster. Um, and they are well known from other formations and that might be the first evidence that these marine reptiles made it up into the rivers of the Kaparowitz. Someone said, where are marine reptiles generally found? Well, they're typically found in ocean rocks. So you have to go out to the east into that Western interior seaway. 
So places like Colorado at this time and even farther east into Kansas and Nebraska uh, have really great records of marine reptiles. I have someone who said, thanks for including Mike Getty in your credits. Uh, you're welcome. Mike Getty was a longtime preparator and field worker um, who started opening up the Kaparowitz when he was with the Natural History Museum of Utah as the collections manager and preparator. He joined me here in Denver and continued that work. So he was a big part of the work that we've been doing here. Um, and he passed away um, while helping us dig a horned dinosaur here in Colorado. Um, but he's a big part of the, the work that we've done and was instrumental in opening up the Kaparowitz. Last question here is, can you extract DNA from bones? Oh, that's a great question. And it's one I get often. Um, you can find pieces of DNA or the building blocks of DNA. Uh, there are paleontologists working on that. So paleontologists who specialize in uh, the molecules of life, so looking for things like um, DNA and other proteins and things like that from bones. We don't have good evidence of DNA from dinosaur bones yet. Um, and that's because DNA as a, as a molecule is fairly unstable. So you don't expect it to survive the temperatures that a lot of these bones were subjected to when they were one or two miles below the surface of the earth. And DNA just in perfect conditions falls apart. It breaks apart over time. And we're talking about millions of years here. But it wouldn't surprise me if snippets and fragments of DNA uh, are described in the near future. In fact, I know there are several paleontologists working hard to find evidence of DNA, or at least pieces of DNA from the bones. Uh, what is the largest dinosaur? Uh, the largest dinosaurs uh, right now currently recognized are the titanosaurs. So these are long necked sauropod dinosaurs. Uh, we haven't found evidence of them in places like the Kaparowitz and uh, Laramidia because they seem to have disappeared for a period of time in North America, but they're really well known in the Southern continents. And the very largest of them, Argentinosaurus and Patagotitan, um, were the size of 15 elephants or more. Um, some of the largest um, terrestrial animals to ever live and they're approaching the size of some of our largest whales. And so uh, the very largest dinosaurs are these titanosaurs and they do make it back into North America. There's um, at least one or two different species that come in at the very end along with T-Rex and that's called Alamosaurus. And so these super giants were around, um, most common in the South though. Well, Joe, thank you very much. That was a lot of questions. You, you went so smoothly through that. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thanks wanted, for the questions. Everyone. Yeah, it looks like we have another one just popped in, but I also want to give Rich a chance if he had a question specifically for um, the presentation, not not the goodbye speech, Rich, just if you had a question or two. Oh, oh, he's on mute. Hold up a second. Good. I probably should ask him to unmute before I ask him a question. All right. No, uh, no questions here, Joe. A fantastic uh, presentation and um, constant um, responses to questions just uh, rattling off you're a true expert. <laughs> well, that's all I, that. I eat, drink, and sleep dinosaurs. You I love do. dinosaurs. Yeah. Well, let me read the last question we have for you before we uh, close out for the evening. If you cut okay. through bones to look at the um, rings to tell the age of the dinosaur when it died what do you do with the bones for later study and someone just slipped in one more question all right <laughs> start yeah, with that one that <laughs> well if you cut bones it's something we call destructive analysis or destruct destructive sampling where you actually have to damage the fossil or the artifact to learn something about it so you have to make sure that what you're learning outweighs the cost of destroying the, the fossil and so for dinosaur bones when we look at the rings when we cut into the bone we typically make a mold of the bone first so that we have the exact shape of the bone before we do anything destructive. And then in some cases, we'll repair the actual fossil by pouring a cast into uh, the mold so that we can restore exactly how it was before. So we wanna make sure that we uh, document exactly what the bone looked like before we do that destruction. And then that last question that just popped up, which period was T-Rex? T-Rex was from the very end of the time of the dinosaurs so the very end of the late Cretaceous in a period called the Maastrichtian. So we were talking mostly about the Campanian and T-Rex and Triceratops are from the Maastrichtian. So about 10 million years younger than the Kaparowitz. Okay. 
Well, I will um, do a few closing announcements and Rich, then we will send our appreciations to Joe as well. Um, before too many people hop off, thank you for attending. Our next event will be tomorrow at 6 p.m. Mountain Time, In Pursuit of Dark Skies, a presentation on viewing dark skies in Utah by Paul Brick Ricketts uh, from the University of Utah South Physics Observatory. The documentary films and native seed plants and seed saving video will also be available for on-demand viewing throughout the week of the festival. And to note, while registration is free, we'd be grateful for donation of any size as a gesture of appreciation. As a nonprofit organization, we rely on contributions to assist in the expenses to produce our festival, even in the virtual format. You may visit our website to make a donation. And to those who have already made one, thank you so very much. And we look forward to seeing you at a future event. And I will allow Rich to, um, to sign off with what he'd like to share. Joe, I just want to give you a big hearty thank you. Terrific presentation Absolutely. and um, great illustrations. Uh, it really helps uh, uh, people like me understand more about uh, prehistoric times in this area. Well, thanks for having me. I love Grand Staircase and the fossils. And you know, if I had to choose one place to focus the rest of my life, it would be working on dinosaurs from Southern Utah. I love it. Yeah. Well, I'm a real advocate for the monument, and uh, so um, hope hope that um, it has a very long future. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again so much, Joe. Really great having you. Hopefully we'll have another collaboration in the future, the festival, maybe even in person. You never know. Absolutely. Anytime. I love talking dinosaurs. So anytime you want. To <laughs> Fantastic. I think a lot of other people love to hear about it too. Yeah, a lot of well, um, well-versed people. And I'm glad you could read the questions on my behalf because yeah. I, I could not go there. I would butcher it terribly. <laughs> All right. Well, everyone looks like they're signing off and saying thank you very much. And um, we thank you and we will um, close off. Have a good evening, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Outstanding. night. Outstanding. Thanks, Joe. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.